What is servant leadership? And what does it look like when a civil engineering company employs this leadership philosophy? Well, in this episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, we're gonna find out. I have with me Ori Eliahu, President and CEO of NGO, and Ori's gonna talk about how NGO is built around the servant leadership model and what it's like to work for an engineering company that is built on servant leadership. It's exciting stuff, and I hope that you'll stick around and hear about this interesting model, and maybe you can apply some of it to your own company. But first, a word from our sponsor for the show, Big Time. Oh my God, this is amazing. I love it. Got it. Wow, Dave, this is amazing. This is really, really cool. The software is great. I honestly, I love this program. These are the real reactions of big time customers when they first toured the software. Big time gives engineering firms the visibility they need to operate more efficiently and maximize profits. From project creation to client payments, big time streamlines operations with intuitive budgeting, project management, and invoicing solutions. Schedule your tour of the number one rated professional services automation software at bigtime.net. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest on to the show today. Ori Eliahu is the president of NGO. Ori, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Ori, it's a pleasure to have you here. And just to kind of get started off, can you start by just telling us a little bit about NGO, where are you located, what services do you offer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. We were founded in 1971 in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we still have our headquarters. Uh, and the company was founded mostly as a geotechnical engineering, engineering geology firm uh, by three founders. And uh, they, two of them were engineers, one geologist. And today we've grown to 22 offices in California, Nevada, Washington, New Zealand, Australia, and Guam. Uh, we have about 400 people and our service lines include geotechnical engineering, environmental engineering, uh, water resources, earthquake engineering, coastal engineering, and such. So a broad spectrum of earth sciences. Wow, that's great. And so, so Ori, tell me about your your road to the seat you're in today. Tell us a little bit about your career background. My career background. Well, I started my career at a very large uh, corporation, Chevron Corporation, uh, as a civil engineer, uh, right after I finished my, my university work, uh, and uh, came to NGO about a little, a little more than five years after that. And I learned a ton in that very large corporation. Um, a lot of things for which I'm very grateful, uh, but also a lot of things that I didn't want to repeat. Uh, so I and a colleague came to NGO literally on the same day. Uh, Paul is still our CFO. And NGO at the time was about 20, 25 people. Uh, and we went through some economic cycles and some ups and downs. and. Finally, in 1992, we uh, took over the leadership of the company. Uh, the three founders then were in the process of retiring and uh, have had a very good run. Of course, we were set back at the Great Recession, but we've had a very good run. Uh, we've learned a lot. We uh, quite immediately uh, sort of began practicing what we thought uh, felt right and felt good, which was the servant leadership model that we have today. Uh, our core values and principles haven't changed all those years. Uh, our ability to articulate them has improved, no question. But uh, uh, we've learned so much from our staff uh, and uh, we were very optimistic about the future. That's great. I want to get into that leadership style in a minute. But before we go there, let me ask you this about your career journey, because I get this question a lot. 
was getting to president of a company or a very high level executive in a company something that you knew you had wanted to do for a long time or did your career just kind of evolve in that way? I think I did want to be in a position to sort of test uh, the values and the core principles and the priorities that I felt could lead to a very harmonious, productive, uh, growing group of people. And when I say growing, I mean personal as well as professional. And whether that would be successful from a business standpoint was a little bit secondary. We really wanted to see how this model would work because it was right. Not, in, in my mind, hadn't been proven as a successful business model. Uh, but it was, uh, we had pretty good conviction that it was a good personal growth model. Hmm, that's great. So what would your staff say is your leadership style? I would hope that they all view me as a servant. Uh, uh, I would hope that they all view me as one who's committed to serving them, serving our clients, serving our communities serving our society. Uh, we draw the org chart with me on the bottom and we try to live that way every day. Uh, uh, as leaders, our job is to serve um, and we measure our individual successes by the growth and the successes of the people that we serve. No, that's great. I mean, that's certainly something that I, I, I don't think you hear all that often. <laughs> unfortunately for a lot of those working in the industry. Uh, I do like the servant leadership model, though. I think it's great. And it, to me, the, I think the one thing that I can, you know, just trying to think through it from kind of your seat a little bit and that you have 400 people and obviously the company's growing fast and we all know how busy the industry is today. So for you to really put that focus back onto your team members and, you know, serve them in that way, um, that has, that really must be a, a mindset and an approach that you have to have on a daily basis that you cultivated over some time to be able to, to be able to do that successfully. Cause I would imagine it's a bit challenging to do. Could you talk about that process? Yeah. You know, that's a very interesting question. I, I haven't given that much thought, but I think it's, I think it's somehow it was programmed, uh, into my, maybe it was my childhood, um, where that was programmed and it, it feels natural. Uh, it, it, and I think that for the leaders in our company, it has, it, it also feels natural. Uh, uh, so yeah, I don't think we have to really struggle to put ourselves in that mindset. Now, for sure, you know, new leaders that are um, given management responsibilities perhaps have to readjust for sure. Uh, and we have to remind each other every day. Uh, but it's not, it's not forced. You know, it, it, it feels right. And we know it when we see it. That's great. That's great, Ori. So Ori, there's a lot that's gone on in our industry. There's a lot that's gone on in the world in the past few years. And, you know, as someone who's leading a company, there are a lot of people looking up to you in good times and bad, of course. So how do you kind of prevent yourself from kind of overreacting or underreacting or just trying to, you know, kind of remain calm and, and able to lead a company through these times like we've had over the past few years? Well, with regard to overreacting, you know, given all of the challenges and struggles that uh, I've been fortunate enough to endure, it's quite easy to put things in perspective and not overreact. We just ask the right questions, uh, seek the facts before jumping to conclusions, and move forward. Uh, as far as underreacting, you know, we're quite committed to speed and efficiency. Uh, that's something that we focus on. It was part of our strategic planning agenda just a couple of weeks ago, week and a half ago. Um, and so we, 
we're very committed to speed and efficiency. What that means is if we do underreact, we can change course very quickly. Mm. And uh, uh, it's rare, I think, that we underreact, but uh, you know, we're getting real time feedback and we waste no time with decisions and with, you know, just moving forward. That's great. And I guess building off of that, you know, the idea of real time feedback brings me to the topic of technology. Everything is moving fast in the world we live in today. Technology, yeah. especially in the world of civil engineering, every day there's a new program that seems to do something faster and better and quicker. And so, how do you see technology affecting our industry? And like, you know, how do you um, like maintain it or stay on top of things with the company as the company grows? Yeah, as you say, you know, technological advancements are ubiquitous. Um, as far as, well, let's talk about the practice of engineering. We have tools now and particularly computing power now where we can really, really refine our solutions, our designs and our answers. Uh, we can really sharpen the pencil. If we use these tools correctly, uh, we can develop much more economical, optimized designs. So that's happening uh, and it's really amazing to watch. Um, it also, of course, uh, there are advancements in AI and there's going to be a lot of uh, transformation of how we do things and particularly cross-discipline where we can do what if models uh, in real time and, uh, and not have to go back to the drawing board every time some design input is changed by our client or by some demand of a regulator. So those are very exciting things. Uh, in terms of practical operations, we're able to collaborate across time zones and oceans much more effectively than we used to. Um, and again, with machine learning and AI coming in, I think we're going to be seeing uh, a very different sort of approach to multidiscipline design. We also have uh, a couple of strategic partnerships with companies that are on the cutting edge of transforming our industry. One is a company that's providing new analytical tools uh, that are unique that mesh very well with some of our systems, some of our GIS systems and other things. Uh, and the other is a company that's developing uh, fully automated construction equipment. So uh, we're, we're very excited about it. We think we're at the forefront. We think that it's important for a company like ours to lead these changes instead of uh, just react to them. Uh, we believe that most companies will either react, which is fine, or they'll bury their heads in the sand and uh, continue with their current practices, which is not fine. I think we'll, they'll disappear over time. That's great. No, I like that. They're partnering with those companies to kind of give you some eyes in different areas and, and different resources. So that's great. So Ori, with this cultural shift in a lot more work from home going on these days. How has that changed NGO? I mean, obviously it's changed the industry in general in different ways, um, but how has it changed how your company operates and maybe how some of our project life cycles might operate going forward in general? So with regard to sort of our internal work practices, we're refining the balance between work from home and in-office collaboration. Obviously, we're doing a lot more work from home than we used to. And we're trying to find the sweet spot. And we're just constantly sort of uh, assessing that to see where the sweet, sweet spot is. And it, it turns out that the sweet spot is not one, one thing, right? Depending on job duties and depending on uh, you know, uh, certain other attributes of one's work, the sweet spot may be a little different. With regard to our clients, uh, you know, we see that they're all over the map. Some of them are 100% work from home. Some are just the opposite. 
And so we have to adapt to that. Uh, as I said earlier, we have fewer meetings we have to fly around for. I used to routinely, uh, weekly, you know, take 10, 12 hours for a round trip for a two hour meeting. Um, and that's unusual uh, anymore. As far as our clients, uh, as far as the demand for the work we're doing, we have, uh, luckily we have clients like Google and Facebook and others that have a certain demand for office space. And uh, initially, of course, with COVID, they paused. But now we've seen them come back and we've seen them have uh, just as strong an appetite. It hasn't really diminished for office space. Uh, I think they too haven't figured out how to translate partial work from home to less office space needs. Mm. Uh, certainly it influences the design layouts of the project of the offices. Uh, there may be a move from small cubicles and large collaboration areas to something different, but the overall demand doesn't seem to have waned. Uh, and we'll just see how that goes. They've restarted their projects. Virtually all our office building clients have restarted their projects. So um, they seem to be moving forward as though, uh, yes, there'll be permanent changes because of what we've learned during COVID, but uh, may not reduce substantially the, the need for collaboration space. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, I think every company has to, you know, take this on, you know, every company is going to be different in this regard and trying to figure out what's going to work best for their staff, depending on their type of projects, their locations. Um, however, it's good to see that companies are trying to jump into this and address it and create some kind of guidelines or atmosphere around this going forward. Um, and, you know, honestly, it's just good to see that it's working out fairly well from what, from companies I've talked to. And, you know, whereas like two years ago, everyone's sentiment was, you know, civil engineering companies can't be remote. You know, it's impossible. It's never, right. gonna, it's never going to work. And then right. overnight, everybody was remote. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it worked okay. You know, it, 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 it works fine in terms of serving the functional need. In terms of serving the human need to be together, it's just not the same. And so, yeah, that's why we have to find that right balance. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. That human uh, piece of it is just so important. All right, so we know that most companies in our industry are busy as it is, but now the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was recently passed, and everyone's going to be more busier soon. Um, so what do you, how do you see the impact of that legislation? What will it be on our industry? in your opinion? I know it's a big deal, a big bill, but I mean, how soon, like, is it coming soon? Are we going to feel that soon? I think there's great anticipation for it uh, among public agencies that we work for, and they're planning their projects as though the money's in their bank account. Okay, there you uh, go. And you're right. It's going to stretch all of us. Uh, it's already difficult to find top-notch people, and uh, we're going to have to not only find new efficiencies, but frankly, draw resources from abroad. Um, I, I think we're very well positioned to do that. We have several offices outside the US, but it, it, I don't see any other way. Um, uh, it, it, I think that to an extent, maybe some projects will go slower as a result of, um, uh, you know, diminished staffing, but uh, we're going to have to pull resources from everywhere. Yeah, no, you're, I mean, listen, it's a simple engineering equation, right? I mean, it's exactly. just it's too much work and not enough people now. Exactly. And there's a lot more work. Coming, right. So. Um, right. But no, that's an interesting take. Yeah. You know, international approach, I think would definitely could be a great way to help to increase your workforce. And it sounds like you're already have that going on since you have offices out of the country. So that seems like that could be a great one, one approach or one solution. I'm sure it's a multi-part solution. Sure. So last question regards to kind of the company and <clears throat> then we'll, we'll go in another direction, but diversity and inclusion is very important. I mean, it's very important generally speaking, but it's also a big topic in our industry these days. 
Um, you know, I know when I went to school, there was only a couple of women in my graduating class of civil engineers. My wife happened to be one of them, but there was only a few of them. And, you know, there's been a big push to change and have more diversity, more inclusion. What does diversity and inclusion mean to you? And how does NGO encourage and support diversity and inclusion? Yeah, I, I think you pointed out something very important. Um, I think the gains that women have made should serve as a model. But there's no question that certain groups are underrepresented in our profession. No two ways about it. And we think that the best way to deal with that is at a very young age, not at the university level. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, we have active STEM outreach programs uh, in high schools, middle schools, and even elementary, um, really in hopes of igniting the same passion that we have for our profession in young kids, uh, getting them excited. We can't think of a more constructive, productive profession than civil engineering. We get to design and build things that will outlive all of us and uh, will change the world. Um, look at what our predecessors built for us. Look at the, the amazing infrastructure. Look at the amazing buildings. Look at the, even going back to the time of the Romans, right? Uh, it shouldn't be difficult to get young people excited about this. Uh, you know, brilliant people have been drawn to uh, other tech, other areas within tech. Uh, but we believe there's nothing as rewarding as the kinds of things we're able to do for, for future societies, instead of something that we build for the next few years until it becomes obsolete. So we're trying to affect it uh, really at a very young age. And uh, share our excitement and our passion in it. Uh, with regard to our hiring, you know, I think for us, we're looking for really smart people who have a warm, compassionate heart and who have a drive, you know, a drive to improve themselves, improve our communities, serve our clients and just, uh, and grow. And what physical package that comes in, those three elements come in, is immaterial to us. Uh, it's, it's really about the personal traits uh, and how, you know, however, whatever vessel they come in, right? Um, now, internally, of course, we're very, very uh, inclusive. Uh, we uh, we uh, collaborate on business planning and we collaborate, we share financial information, everything else. We're one family. Once you're in the NGO family, you're family. Um, our, our management meetings are open to employees. Uh, and again, we try to be as inclusive of everyone as we can be. That's sort of how we're looking at the world. Uh, we, we really want to influence it sort of uh, in, in, in the uh, formative stages. Uh, and you're right, the gains that women have made in my career span is a shining example. And, you know, that didn't happen at the hiring level or the university level. That, that happened before that. Yeah. No, I agree with you 100%. I mean, we need to get out there into elementary schools and educate everyone about engineering. And we especially need to get into underrepresented communities um, exactly. so that they can get access to that information as well. And really, in addition to, you know, well, you know, all of the benefits of diversity and inclusion and different perspectives it will bring into our profession, we need more engineers, generally speaking, like we just talked about. In general, there's so much work, there's so much opportunity for these young children if they can help to put two and two together, if we can educate them on what we do. And it's an exciting industry, like you said. You know, we build things that, you know, support civilization, essentially. And so exactly. um, it's glad to hear you speak, you know, talk about the importance of youth and getting out there. That's where, to me, I agree, diversity and inclusion needs to can mostly be increased from there. So that's great. Yeah, and particularly, as you say, in 
underprivileged, underrepresented communities. That's where we're targeting our outreach. And uh, it's been very rewarding. So yeah, we intend to continue that for sure. That's great. All right, we're going to switch it up a little bit here and ask you a couple of questions that I frequently get from practicing civil engineers out there and I'm going to pitch them out to you, all right? All right, so the first one here is, what is the number one trait that you feel is important for civil engineering professionals to have today? Hunger. Hunger to advance our profession, hunger to help society, as you say, uh, hunger to advance, hunger to learn new things, hunger to serve, hunger to serve our clients, uh, to serve each other, to serve our communities. It's, it's really about that uh, in my mind. That's great. Here's a question I often get from civil engineers. How can I make sure that I'm adding value to my organization? How would you answer that question? How can a civil engineer make sure they're adding value to their organization? I say just be curious. Always ask uh, questions and ask for more. Ask for more different types of work. Ask for more work. Um, ask for more challenges. Uh, only you know uh, what what is your sort of challenge threshold um, and stretch. Uh, so be curious and stretch. Uh, particularly uh, stretch uh, technically and psychologically and in terms of, of serving. That's great. What is one business challenge that I can solve that would make the single biggest impact on the organization? So basically what I'm trying to get at with this question is, you know, trying to uncover some of the bigger challenges in the industry that, you know, professionals that are hungry and they want to really help their firms that they could help their firms to overcome or attack? Yeah, you know, for us in our hiring, we continue to raise the bar. Um, thank goodness I'm not applying for a job at NGO today. I've never even got an interview. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I would say the one, the biggest challenge is finding top talent um, and uh, and uh, continuing to raise the bar and never settling for anything less than top talent. And so when the bar is very high, the pool is small. And uh, today that's our biggest challenge. On the other hand, we think we're well positioned to attract the best and brightest. Uh, and we also think that the um, you know, the, the inability to hire as many as we would like has stretched us all and allowed us to find new efficiencies as well. That's great. And this next question, I, you know, you may have just answered it, but I'll ask it anyway, which is, which is what are you most afraid of regarding the future success of the industry? I mean, more work is coming, so that's a good thing, but what's, what are you worried about with all that? <laughs> well, I don't, the word afraid is not in our vocabulary, you yeah. know, with our culture, with our very, very supportive family culture, which is something that, that uh, is so valuable to us, we would hold on to it even to our business detriment. Um, we're not afraid of anything. I can't recall a meeting where we were afraid of something. Um, we think that, you know, if if we continue to serve, if we're smart, if we're innovative and we're resourceful, uh, the things that most firms are afraid of, which are either dramatic change or a downturn in the economy, uh, will only help us advance relative to others. It'll help us gain market share. Uh, because we, we just think that, um, you know, when times get tough, the fittest do better. Uh, and uh, so we're really, we're optimistic about the future, regardless of the external forces that we can't control. That's great. And yeah, I mean, I really like the like I said, the servant leadership model is a great model. And I've talked to leaders that practice it. And 
not a lot of leaders in the industry. So I'm happy to hear that you've employed that. Um, and when you have, when you conduct interviews or do you have that conversation with candidates about the, the leadership model? Very much so. Uh, I think that, I, I think that most applicants here sort of already know by reputation what our culture is like. They've heard, uh, but even the ones that are not aware, I think they get the flavor very early in the conversations. Uh, I hope it shows uh, from the minute one walks in the front door, uh, by the way they're greeted um, and by the way they're treated here. Uh, and, uh, you know, our doors are open literally and figuratively. We don't close doors. Uh, even now for this interview, my door is not closed. Um, and so we're open book and we're truly here to serve our staff and our clients and our communities. That's great. All right. I got a couple of last questions and this is really a little bit more focused on you for a minute here. When you come to work every day, Ori, there's a lot of stuff going on. How do you decide where your focus needs to be? Yeah. So much of it is determined by just client requests, client demands. Uh, so I have a certain part of my calendar that uh, is, is devoted to that. Um, and that's, a little bit unpredictable. Uh, but beyond that, it's a matter of just prioritizing. You know, we'll always prioritize a current client, no matter how small, over a prospective client, no matter how big. We will always make time for staff. Like I say, the doors open day or night, uh, literally 24-7. Uh, if there's a staff need, if there's some someone has a need, whether it's personal or work-related, doesn't matter. It's all one thing. Um, it, it, we always, always make time. Uh, there's, there's never a situation where we, where we don't have time for someone's issue or someone's problem or someone's request. Um, so I try real hard to not spend any time on things that are not either serving a staff member or a client. Um, uh, Period. So I have gotten away from reviewing leases and reviewing purchase requests and reviewing all sorts of things that I used to spend time on um, and uh, tried to focus on that. That's great. That's awesome. Another question I get a lot is what are, what are leaders in our industry read? So I'm wondering if you had a favorite book in your career that was beneficial for you or an author or something that you can share that was beneficial in your development. Boy, there've been so many. Um, I would say the ones that are easiest to read and easiest to digest and put into practice are the books by Patrick Lencioni. One that comes to mind is The Ideal Team Player. So simple, so easy to read, so fundamental, and yet enlightening. Uh, it, it's, uh, he has a way of doing that. Uh, I, I would recommend those books. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of books I've written are, are, have nothing to do with the engineering profession that have been meaningful. Um, I would just, yeah, I would encourage people to read things that are not directly related to our work. It opens our eyes. Uh, to many other approaches, many other technologies, many other ways of thinking. Uh, it's very beneficial. That's great. Last question I have for you, Ori, is, you know, in, as a leader of a company, president, CEO, I'm sure well, I'm thinking that you probably communicate with other leaders in the industry. And I'm just wondering, you know, are, are there any other civil engineering CEOs that you admire? And, you know, you can mention their name or not, but do you have a way or do, are you in communication with other leaders really is the gist of the question, how you kind of keep up on what other companies are doing, or is that something that you, you do? You know, I've had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know many, many other CEOs. We generally sort of uh, march to our own drummer, uh, but no question there are, um, Folks at my generation that have done amazing, uh, amazing work in growing their organizations, people like Rudy Bonaparte at Geosyntec or uh, Dan Batrack at 
Tetra Tech, uh, and others. Um, our, our style uh, isn't better or worse. It just works for us real well. Um, and so, you know, we kind of do our own thing. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about other firms. Uh, we just believe that if we stay true to our um, values and our vision and our mission, uh, we'll succeed. We don't have to emulate anyone. But I do admire a lot of leaders in our field. That's great. Well, once again, we're talking with Ori Eliahu, president of NGO. And Ori, I just want to say I know how busy you are, and you took quite some time with us here today. And I want to thank you for your time with us. I, I really appreciate your sentiments. I love what you're doing with servant leadership. I think it's great. And I think, uh, you know, I hope that a lot of civil engineering professionals can find firms like yours to work at. So thank you for taking the time here with us today. Thank you. Anthony. Appreciate it. So I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ori Eliahu, President and CEO of NGO. I do really love the servant leadership model, and it's great to see it being used in the world of civil engineering. And I hope that, you know, you've taken something away from this episode that you can utilize and apply in your career. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis, so please be sure to subscribe to our channel here so you can get access to all of our videos where we're focused on helping engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.